everybody. Glad that you guys could make it today. And I'm just going to take a few minutes and go over risk management. That was going to be our topic today. And this is the quickest way that I knew that I could get it out. We're going to look at ways that you can improve your aquaculture operation and some of the planning that you need to do in order to be able to maximize your profits, be able to plan for the worst and hope for the best. One of the things that we truly understand about aquaculture is that most of the things we encounter uh, are not certain. We have weather issues, financial issues, uh, personnel and staffing issues, disease issues with fish. And so we need to be constantly aware that we can lose a substantial amount of crop at any time, especially if we don't follow the rules that we're up against uh, monitoring water quality, making sure the fish are fed and whatnot. And so those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at here today through the rest of this presentation. So what types of risk are we talking about? Well, one of the major risks that we need to look at is something that involves a loss of the animals that we might be caring for. Uh, the levels of risk vary depending on what the species might be or the life stage that these animals are in. As you already know, the smaller the fish, generally the more challenges that you have with providing that animal with food and quality water. One of the other things that aquaculture has in its back pocket is that we're way behind some of the other traditional agriculture models that are out there. When we look at swine or poultry, they're literally decades ahead of us when it comes to risk management and the types of operations that they have compared to what we know. Also, we don't know nearly as much biology about our animals as we would like to believe. As we continue to go down the list, and as we continue to write down potential things that might be a risk, the list gets pretty long pretty fast. And some of the ones that strike us immediately are divided into the two categories below, what we might call a socioeconomic risk versus a pure or some kind of physical risk. Here you can see a couple of simple socioeconomic risk. Uh, consumer tastes, you know, that varies almost with the wind and their attitudes about certain products are not far behind it. And certainly in the age that we are now, uh, social behavior is kicking in quite a bit. And the reality of all this is that maybe for aquaculture to expand and to meet the needs of the people, we need to understand that some of these attitudes of the individuals can often change. And even the people's attitudes toward aquaculture and what that means might change. Uh, the other changes that occur, which we're always up against, are what my colleagues call the swinging pendulum. Things that change in government, things that change in the industry as a whole, and some of the things that we look at concerning uh, off flavoring or bad products or finding out a product really isn't what you thought it was. Uh, the grouper issue here in Florida is pretty extreme. And so some of the things that we look at in those areas are definite risks to your business and we need to be aware of those. We can see that uh, other economic risks are also present uh, anytime the price shifts in any part of the business, that affects what we do. It might be due to inflation. It might be due to, well, frankly, coronavirus. It might be due to some other uh, potential outbreak that causes people to move away from aquaculture or to move away from doing business in general and save their money. Maybe there are loss of jobs in some areas and that does tend to affect us because aquaculture is linked to a lot of different uh, markets out there. Uh, something that might put a threat on our doorstep. Uh, the item I listed here was war with a question mark, but for some countries, that's a reality. If you have a war breakout in your country, then you're probably not going to be thinking about aquaculture very much. You're going to be thinking about survival. All of those are risks. And how do you manage against something like that? If the demand lags behind supply, what are we supposed to do? We think of all the current things that are going on right now with the protective gear devices and the extreme 
lag of supply where the demand is sky high. Imagine if something like that happened to a food source, uh, we could be in real trouble. And so those are all things we want to consider when we're trying to figure out what our risks might be and what we can tolerate. I would say that before you get too deeply involved in any kind of aquaculture production, you need to understand what the market is doing and you need to understand what you can sell, where you can sell it, and how often you're going to be able to sell it. Uh, sometimes you might have a really sweet situation where you're working with a packer or a processor or a shipper and they're great until one day you don't have the product that they need and then all of a sudden you're off the list. You don't have the ability to provide their product and so they end up going to someone else. Uh, the opposite of that might be maybe this processor has the ability to store something long term. If you happen to be in the frozen food market or you're on the front end of the frozen food market, that would be a great spot to hang out if you were worried about, you know, sales over the course of the year. Well, because your business partner, your processor can freeze that product, they can take product almost any time. And that certainly helps you. Let's look at a couple of issues that involve a risk to your marketing. One of the major issues that we think about is when do you move that particular product? Is your product something that is a factor of a certain season? Does your animal normally mature in the fall season? Do you have the option of being able to hold that animal over the winter if you can't sell it in the fall. This is what we commonly see in the catfish market. And you can see these guys down here in this photo harvesting away. And while that looks great in the fall, uh, if you can't move all of those animals out, then you're stuck and you have to figure out a way to hold those animals. And every animal that stays in the pond an additional day beyond market is costing you money. Maybe you have an extreme weather condition that doesn't really help you out. Right now we're in a drought. Uh, we've gone for a long, long time and we don't have any rain. All the farmers right now to maintain their ponds are having to pump water. And while the water doesn't cost anything, the electricity to move it around certainly does. And so that can be a challenge. Maybe you get an opportunity to take advantage of a new fish, uh, something that everybody wants. You know, it's the hot fish of the day or the week or the month or the season and you decide I'm gonna produce a bunch of those really quickly, what we call a short run, and then you know, when that's over and they're sold, then I'm gonna go back to standard production. Or maybe you decide you're gonna grow your operation. Maybe the market forecasting for your animals look really, really good. And you decide you're gonna get in on the ground of that, and so you expand your operations. Well, that's a huge investment. Uh, maybe you wanna do a change in densities, Maybe you want to do a change in the way that you do business and the times of year that you provide products. All of those things involve risk. And sometimes we find that once you start a particular process, uh, you get yourself in trouble because you can't quit building it once you've already invested money and time. Uh, it's really hard to turn a product around and find another use for it. Sometimes you have certain schedules you have to keep and a risk to marketing may involve that production schedule. If the best time to have fish, for example, is in the middle of the Lenten season, like it is, you know, basically right now, then, you know, what do you do if you can't put fish on the market at that time? You're going to miss a big business opportunity. So production risks have to be considered. Uh, do you invest in a new animal? Do you put more fish into the pond or the tank and hope that they get to market size by the time that you need them? Uh, you need to consider that as part of your day to day as well. A lot of times we find that in fish production, especially food fish production, the availability of our starter fish, what we call fingerlings, is a major bottleneck. You can see these fingerling harvesters here on this catfish farm, and they're pulling out thousands and thousands of animals 
Well, those animals are going to have to go into a grow out pond somewhere, but even at this size, and these are pretty good sized fingerlings here, it's going to take weeks to get them acclimated, to get them growing, and then by the end of the season, hopefully, you know, sep September, October, you have something that can benefit you. One of the things that we found was an extreme challenge down here in Florida is a lack of trained people to actually work in the industry. As you may know, that's why the entire aquaculture program at Hillsborough Community College was created. And it's still a major issue. All of the farmers I talk to who wanna hire people want them to have a super amount of knowledge, maybe even more so in some cases than what our program is designed to train. And they literally want people to take over the entire operation, I don't know, so they can go on vacation or whatever. Um, but that's a serious consideration. Maybe you are looking to hire new people, but you don't want to have to invest the time to train them up. You need them to be able to hit the ground running, so to speak. And those are risks as well. Financial risks, credit restriction, uh, a lack of knowledge by the person who you're doing business with. Uh, I find myself constantly educating people about aquaculture, what it is, what we do. And Florida is an aquaculture friendly state. You know, the commissioner of agriculture is well aware that we have major industry here, and yet the general public seems to be fairly ignorant. Anytime politicians battle in Washington, uh, that kind of screws us over. Uh, it not only can mess up the individual farmer, but it can mess up the entire state as far as the attitude and funding toward new initiatives in aquaculture or maybe support when business is bad. Uh, those are things that you need to consider. Uh, all of these things together uh, fall under a pretty serious set of categories uh, and they can really hurt us. A lot of those are people related. Some of the other risks that are out there are what we call physical or pure risks. That is the environment. And much of the environment that we deal with, we can't really plan against and we can't battle it. Um, it's pretty hard to battle against a hurricane. If a tornado comes through your farm and tears up all your buildings and puts a huge tract of land, uh, a ditch, a new ditch <laughs> through your farm, well, you didn't plan for that. And so that's not something that you're going to battle against. You just have to deal with the aftermath. If you want to be able to take advantage of the situation, you have to be able to figure out how you're going to manage the risk. And so what do we do in order to do that? Well, one thing is you have to sit down like we kind of just did and identify what all the risks are. Uh, you need to find out how much of an impact they're going to have on you economically and that if those risks actually threaten your business, what are you going to do to try to mitigate them? One of the best strategies that the farmers can possibly be involved in is something we call diversification. Now diversification is something that we use all the time in the financial market. It protects us from one part of the market doing poorly while the other part of the market might be doing okay. The same thing can happen in farming. If you have a crop that on one particular year does not sell very well, well, maybe you have other crops that do sell well. And so the average comes to uh, your benefit at the end of the year. Maybe you decide you're gonna sell a product out of season, uh, an alternative strategy to marketing, that can help you. Maybe you buy crop insurance, uh, it's expensive, but they do have it and right now considering the situation we're in here in florida there's a lot of people who are not only selling insurance but they're providing other benefits for farmers as well uh, trying to help them through a rough spot when they can't get out there and maybe do as much business as they had previously as i mentioned before diversification diversification is pretty important when we look at diversification, just think of growing as much variety as you can. Uh, if you look at the ornamental fish industry, this is certainly true. I don't know anyone who specializes in one particular fish. Uh, some farmers literally have hundreds of different species on their farm, and that is so that they can protect themselves against a market turn in one way or the other. Uh, the catfish farmers and the food fish production people will do this too, but they do it in a different way. 
um, they get involved in something called vertical integration where they control the food processing, they control the feeding of the fish and the marketing of the fish. They might even control uh, the food that actually goes into the fish where they own their own feed mill or something like that. And so that's very, very helpful. Maybe you diversify yourself into something that doesn't involve aquaculture like fertilizer sales or uh, hay production, uh, something like that. All of these help spread your risks around and can help your business in the time where it's uh, not so economically plentiful. Maybe you try to sell your products through uh, different times of year, uh, sequential marketing versus continuous marketing. Continuous marketing, kind of like the ornamental industry, uh, you're just selling fish all year. Uh, we have the ability to hold fish all year round down here. There, it's not so much a season as it is a stream of animals coming out. Uh, a few of them that we deal with are basically sequential uh, or they're you know only offered at a really good rate a couple times a year but for the most part we can put ornamental fish of most kinds in any pet store year round and that's to the advantage of the farmer another risk management tool is crop insurance uh, the crop insurance here in florida probably isn't very good the ornamental industry, uh, the people literally have millions of dollars sitting in their ponds and people don't like to insure that. Uh, they also don't like to accept low premiums. And so if you look at one to 2% of the crop value on an ornamental fish, uh, the premiums get to be rather astronomical. And so people don't uh, wanna do that. They'll just go without. Um, I've heard some farmers say that on every uh, third or fourth year, you should expect to have a major problem. And those are pretty bad odds when you're looking at uh, farming and doing it successfully. Uh, this next one is kind of odd, forward contracting. Uh, that's basically you, the farmer, guaranteeing so many pounds or so many fish uh, five months from now. Um, they do this with soybeans and grain products all the time. Uh, they call it the futures market and it's pretty serious and it's also pretty risky. Uh, because if you can't provide the fish at the right time or the right amount, then you have to find it from someone else who has them. And you will pay huge amounts of money in penalties if you can't provide the contracted uh, number or the contracted poundage of fish. Um, I would never get involved in this, uh, but some people do because it can be pretty lucrative. Here's a good example. This is a graph of the catfish distribution throughout the year. You can see the average price per pound in cents. And if you look at that graph pretty quick, it tells you right away that once you get outside of the Lenten season in February, then there, nobody has any catfish. Uh, all the catfish from the previous year have been sold. And so you're looking at new catfish at that point from March, April, May. Uh, once you get to May and June, uh, the price of catfish is really, really high because nobody has any. And if you had catfish at that time of year, you could make a killing. But unfortunately, all the catfish that you're going to have are going to be small. Nobody's going to hold catfish that long. It's going to be an economic disaster for them. And then as you can see from about September down into even December, the price of catfish drops way out on this example. And that's because everybody is harvesting them. So the market gets flooded with supply. Uh, even though the demand is fairly good, the price has to drop. Otherwise, farmers can't move their product when they need to. And they definitely don't want to hold them for another year. Production contract, uh, the same thing as a futures market like I talked about before, except it's one step worse. You're actually working for somebody else. Uh, this is what they call corporate farming. And corporate farming might be the future for us because a lot of farmers in the food industry, the grain industry can't keep up. Uh, their farms get eaten up by larger farms and the small farmer is going away because they can't do things efficiently. Uh, you might be able to argue that for some parts of the aquaculture industry too. Uh, if you don't run your business really efficiently or provide a product that someone else does not have, it's hard to make money when things go bad. And so we'll see after this economic uh, situation we're in right now, what the ornamental fish industry in Florida looks like. 
my guess is it's going to rebound, but it's probably going to be a shift in who actually controls the majority of the business and who are the larger farms by the time it shakes out. What's that mean at the end of the day? Well, if uh, your farm is starting to go under, it might mean you have to get involved in some kind of government program. Now, not all government programs are bad. Some of the government programs that we have out there are really good. Uh, this last one that I listed, CRP, stands for Conservation Reserve Program. And normally, that is something we associate with terrestrial farming, uh, grains and things like that. Uh, the CRP uh, initiative was set aside so that farmers could choose to plant alternative crops uh, around the edge of their field and that provided natural habitat for migratory birds, for uh, species that were native to the area that needed habitat to live and to feed and the government paid pretty handsomely for it and as a matter of fact on a really poor year for grain production you might actually make more money putting your land in CRP ground than you would farming corn, soybeans, or wheat, which is pretty phenomenal. I don't know if anything like that exists for fish, but it would be interesting to see if you could make it happen. If you ever get yourself into an extreme bind, I suppose you could turn to an investor of some kind to bail you out. Uh, this is not something I would advise unless you have a really good relationship with your investor. I would think that that would be a pretty big problem and the use of outside equity uh, always involves a transfer of risk from you to someone else and they may just not be able to take on that risk that might not be something that you can convince them uh, is a good idea to do unless you're a really good producer and you have a really strong track record of being able to manage existing risks well now the last one here is kind of a thing we don't think about uh, the use of personal protective gear and safety devices on the farm or maybe in the laboratory. Normally OSHA takes care of this and they say, look, you have to have it. But when you go out to a farm, it all disappears. Nobody wears helmets. Nobody puts on life jackets on a fish farm. Uh, they walk out there in Florida in flip flops and shorts and no shirt and they do their job every single day. Uh, if they get cut, they put a bandaid on it. If they stub their toe, they start wearing shoes. Uh, if they fall in the water, they get back out of the water, assuming that they don't hit their head. Uh, but if you go into larger businesses, uh, some places will make you wear a life jacket, waders, and a helmet uh, in case you have a slip, a trip, or a fall because it could be a potential hazard, especially if nobody's around to help you out. Uh, you might have issues of technology failure where you don't have a monitoring system and your building catches on fire and it burns to the ground. That happened to a research lab I used to work in and they lost a million dollar building. So it can be a big, big problem but a lot of people can't afford the technology to do that or they can't afford to maintain the technology. So it becomes a money issue like everything else. Uh, the other thing that technology can actually work against you in is it provides you with security, but it could be a false sense of security. I mean, if your building is always being monitored, why go in and look around the building on the weekends? Uh, that can be a problem. If something would go wrong with a tank, Maybe your technology isn't set up to tell you that the water quality failed. Or maybe your tank uh, is overflowing instead of losing water and you, know, you wasted a ton of water, but your monitoring device didn't tell you that. But your water bill certainly would. So just a couple of final thoughts on risk management. Hopefully I've been able to give you guys a little bit of an overview of things to consider. And remember, you can always act and you can always think ahead and you always manage what you can um, but overall be careful when you do it so that you can provide the best opportunity for your fish or whatever your crop is as well as the people that you work with or that you work for have a good one